welcome to the webinar. Um, Rebooting Your Growth and Exit Plans is uh, co-hosted by PM Corporate Finance and the FD Centre. I'm uh, My name is Sean Nichols. I'm just going to take you through a couple of housekeeping points before we get into the presentations. Um, we'll finish at 12 noon. We will run to time. Um, we know we've all, you've all got busy, uh, busy schedules, so we'll get through the content. Um, to save you time um, scribbling down notes, the session will be recorded and a summary of the slides will be made available uh, in a follow-up email. And there will be an opportunity to post questions to any of our presenters. Um, there is a Q&A box uh, in the control panel at the bottom or top of your screen. Please use it um, throughout the session for any questions. We will collate those and we'll pose those um, to our speakers. Uh, the agenda, quick run through. Um, Jeremy Hyde from the FD Centre will kick off um, uh, with the role of the FD, uh, followed by uh, Philip Alangaju, who will talk about exit strategy, valuation, and some bits on acquisition. Uh, we then go back to Jeremy, um, getting your house in order, um, thinking about exit. And then Lake Falconer will conclude with exit options and uh, where the MA market is today and in the near future. As I said, we will conclude with a QA. and a um, So please um, post questions uh, using the, using the Q&A box. So that's our agenda. There are three speakers. Jeremy, it's over to you. Thank you, Sean, and good morning, everybody. So 2020, what a year it's been. Who could have imagined some of the events that were gonna happen this year? Um, back in March, the economy was flying, businesses were doing well, and then lockdown, and people losing their jobs, and companies going out of business. I was really worried back in March when the government first announced it, but I have to say, as I've watched the SME, particularly the SME community deal with this, um, I have complete admiration for SME business owners and the resilience that they've displayed over the past um, nine months or so. And it's fair to say that um, with the right financial management, a company will succeed uh, and can succeed uh, no matter what the business environment faces, uh, throws at it. And, and actually, um, those tools and techniques for effective financial management in your company are just as relevant in these uncertain times, but are probably more critical. So this morning, I'd like to share with you some of those tools and techniques to help you grow your business, improve your profitability and cash flow, and ultimately the value of your business. And I'll share with you um, those key aspects of effective financial management, which is basically the role of the finance director. But before I do that, I'd like you to take a, a moment just to think about your business and what it is that you want from your business. And like all good successful business journeys, they start with the end in mind. What's your end in mind? What do you want from your business? It might be that you wanna grow your sales line or your profitability. You may wanna exit at some point, in which case, how much do you want for your business? And, and when do you wanna do that? And it doesn't matter what your end in mind is, as long as you've got one. And then with that, that can set the context then for your business journey. And your business journey began a few years ago and the green circle here, that, that uh, represents today. So over the past few years, your business grew. And in the early days, I would imagine that uh, most of the work was done by you as the owner of the business. You were the business effectively, but as you've grown and you've brought in more people, Things have got more complex uh, and you need additional people to help you. And as you continue that, that scale up journey, for sure, you're going to need to build the infrastructure to enable you to continue to grow effectively. And you'll need to have people around you that have got expertise in those various elements of business. And one of those is going to be a finance director and a finance director will help you with that support. So they'll be looking at compliance, legal reporting, getting your tax returns in on time, getting your um, annual accounts in on time, 
tax is an interesting one because that touches on the strategy as well. The way that you structure your business will have an impact, uh, a big impact later on when you come to sell your business. And PEM have got some great expertise in this area so they can help you with that. Also outsourcing. So typically an SME, they can't afford and don't need a full-time senior HR director or an entire IT function, but they do need those services. And it's the FD's role to make sure the company gets what it needs and that you're not paying too much for it. And finally, banking relationships. A good banking relationship with your bank is vital throughout your journey. So the FD, that's a two-way process. The FD needs to make sure that the bank is comfortable with you, got confidence in you by providing the right information and having the right conversations. But also the bank, we know what good, look, good looks like. We know what the banks can provide. And it's up to us to make sure that you get what you need from your bank as well. So with those aspects, that infrastructure, and they are the, effectively the foundation stones of your financial management your business's sector continue to grow. But today's webinar, it's about accelerating growth, right? This is about changing the course of your business. So this is where we start to look at the operational aspects of financial management and your business. So this is the systems and the processes and the information that you use for decision-making. This is about getting underneath the skin of the numbers, identifying where you're making your money, which customers are profitable, which products and services are making money? Where are you losing money? And all of this, this is about identifying opportunities to improve your profitability and cash flow. And cash flow is a really important aspect in the operational space as well. So the majority of finance systems, they're great at reporting uh, you know, your profit and loss. Um, and they're good at reporting historic information, but they don't report cash flow effectively and they certainly don't give you um, the future there's no uh, crystal ball finance system that i know of at the moment so this is where the fd role comes in working with you and your teams looking at what could be the scenarios of your growth and your your budget going into the future and uh, understanding your cash flow looking at the next 12 months are there any pinch points in the next 12 months where there's cash flow gaps that we need to bridge with those operational aspects, you're set to change the fortunes of your business and can continue to grow. But there's another area which is even more valuable, um, and that is the strategic benefits of financial management. This will take you to that end in mind in the shortest period of time. And this is about understanding where it is that you want to go as a business. What is that end in mind? And then reverse engineering and identifying the key steps that take you from where you are today to that point in the future. What's your sales and marketing strategy? What's your operating plan? And typically, it's a natural thing. People are focused on the operational aspects of their roles in the company. And they don't have time to look at the big picture all the time. It's that classic working in the business as opposed to on the business. And it's the FD's role to bring this strategy to life and make sure that people, yep, they've got one eye on the important operational day-to-day -day stuff, but they're also looking at big picture and thinking, what have I done in terms of my objectives this month, this quarter, to move you and us towards that end in mind? Risk management is also important. So it's not that exciting looking at what could go wrong, but it is important. And you can't stop all the eventualities happening, of course not, but at least if you plan through and think in the event, what do we do, how can we manage that? Then you can mitigate the impact and you can ensure that your business will survive uh, in the worst case scenario. And finally, strategic funding. Most businesses that have aspirational plans and strategies to build their business will likely need some form of fun funding along the way and that could be debt equity invoice financing uh, is a great facility for businesses that are growing their sales line rapidly and we will find the right source of funding that enables you to achieve your strategy and your end in mind so now i'd like to share with you a case study of a business that we worked with and this focuses on the operational aspects of the finance director's role and this was a profitable business, so they were making profits of 4.6 million, but they were burning cash. 
And at the year before we started to work with this business, um, it consumed 3.3 million in cash flow. So we took a look under the bonnet of the financials and we identified that just a 1% improvement across seven key levers could improve the cash flow of this business by over a million and increase profitability by 924,000. So we spoke to the owner, a classic response, which is why I love working with entrepreneurs. If I increase my sales volume by 20%, surely that will increase my profitability and resolve my cash flow issues, right? Unfortunately, as you can see from the slide, for any 1% improvement in sales volume in this business, because of the working capital dynamics, this business needed 43,000 in additional uh, cash flow to fund the working capital. So a 20% increase, over 800,000 in cash flow, plus the sales and marketing investment that would be needed. It wasn't an option for this business. So we had to take a deeper dive into the numbers and we identified opportunities to increase cash flow and profitability in other areas. Net result, we improved the profitability of this business by 2.1 million. And more importantly, we increased cash flow by 3.8 million, which actually turned this business from a cash consumer to a cash generator, which has an important psychological value to people looking at your business. And as you can see, a major contributor towards this turnaround in performance was in pricing. And it's important to say at this point, this wasn't a case of just putting up the prices uh, and see what happens. There were a number of customers that were quite price sensitive and they wouldn't have taken a, a, a large or even a, a small price increase, but there were others. They were more focused on the quality and the reliability that this business provided. They were comfortable with having price increases and some of them hadn't had a price increase for some time. So we worked through negotiating, looking at the different customer groups and the net impacts. We were able to increase pricing by 2.1 million overall, which more importantly gave an additional 1.7 million in cash flow. The other area which contributed to this turnaround was the debtor days. And a bit like pricing, there were different customer groups here. So some of them enjoyed their terms uh, and didn't want to change, but there were others. They weren't cash sensitive. They were comfortable paying earlier, making progress payments or even advance payments. And a number of the repeat customers, we turned over to direct debit, which meant that we collected the money earlier and it was automatic. So negating the need for chasing up uh, outstanding debts. But what does all this mean? We've increased the profitability of this business by 2.1 million. We've increased cash flow and turned it into a, a cash pos positive business. But what does that mean in terms of the value of the business? Well, as a result of the work that was done here, this business increased its value by 10.4 million pounds. So when we first started with working with the company, if that company had sold at that time, the proceeds from the sale less the debts that the business had, the owner was effectively in a negative equity position at this point to the tune of 300,000. As a result of the work that we did here, this business was now worth over 10 million pounds. And it's important to say at this point that this is only the operational aspects. We haven't got into the strategic aspects at this point. It was the same customers, the same products and services, but we were managing the financials more effectively. Net impact, 10.4 million. I've got another case study uh, to share with you, uh, a study, a, a, a case study or a story of a, an amazing uh, scale up and it touches on both the operational and the strategic aspects. But before I do that, it's my pleasure to hand you over to Philip. Philip's gonna talk to us now about exit, exit strategy uh, and business valuation. So over to you, Philip. Thanks, Jeremy, thank you. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, happy day one of lockdown. Bit of an oxymoron there, but uh, mo moving swiftly on. My name's Philip um, Alagadu. I'm a director in the corporate finance team uh, within PDM. Uh, and today I'll be discussing uh, exit strategies for post COVID 19 world, uh, the impact of COVID 19 um, uh, and uncertainty on valuations, and whether now is the time for acquisition. So when, when it comes to the word strategy, there's plenty of, of flippant usage. Um, essentially, strategy is a, is a plan of action 
designed to achieve an overall aim. Um, so before we can really start talking about exit, there are certain day-to-day -day, uh, actions that already need to be in place. Uh, so it's kind of aligned with, with Jeremy's earlier presentation. Uh, I've got here what, what I like to um, refer to as the 10 uh, post-COVID-19 commandments that need to be in place before redeveloping an exit strategy. Namely, um, commandment one, detailed cash flows, robust cash flow forecast to enable you to understand the impact um, of decisions that are being made right now um, on cash. Commandment number two, um, good management information, crucial for making good business decisions. A lot of these will be pretty obvious, but it's always good to, to kind of be clear here. Um, commandment number three, uh, interrogate your pipeline um, to assess level of activity and likelihood of new work coming in. Commandment number four, always have a deep review of your supply chain to remove any inefficiencies in your business. Commandment number five, um, analyze the staffing levels continually to, to measure productivity and, and ensure there's always a deliver, uh, delivery down to your bottom line. Um, commandment number six, pretty obvious, but you know, stay close to your customers because that's where your work is effectively going to come from further down the line. Number seven, identify any competitive advantages. And I'll come to talk about um, some of those later on. Uh, commandment number eight, continually communicate internally. This will help to build confidence and drive confidence in your business. Number 10, retain cash for all sorts of contingencies, which I think has been critical over the last um, eight, eight or nine months. Um, and number 10, be decisive, make decisions, make them quickly um, and implement them. And these commandments will, will help to, to stabilize your business um, and create sufficient bandwidth for growth, for sure. So once these 10 commandments are in place, um, it's time to implement a three-stage strategic review, referred to in academic circles as a phoenix encounter. Now, what does that mean? That's effectively that you theoretically burn your company down to the ground and build it back up in, in three stages. Um, stage number one, review the current status of, of your business, whether that's like SWOT analysis, um, review your mission statement, your strategic priorities. What, what's the current state status of your business? Stage number two, identify any factors that may potentially destroy your business. So I kind of referred to competitive advantages earlier on. I guess this is sort of competitive disadvantages, you know, emerging technologies, um, business model innovation. Digit we're seeing massive trends um, of digital transformation, digitalization of businesses, um, the high street in terms of a, a retail perspective, you know, a, a bricks and mortar retailers are crumbling because of societal shift, which is another factor when people kind of shifting towards online, online purchasing behaviors. All of these things um, need to be considered when you're looking at the stage two of your Phoenix encounter. And then stage three, finalize the defensive plan including you know, who, who, who are the new strategic leaders in your business, um, organizational priorities in the short, medium and long term um, in order for you to develop action plans to implement going forward. And, and so you know, have your 10 commandments in place, carry out this three stage strategic review. And then at that point, you know, we can start to think about what all of these things mean in terms of an exit. So obviously it's key, get your business in the best possible shape operationally and financially. In terms of financials, Jeremy's already touched upon some of the ways in which the, the, the FD Centre can help you from a, from a finance director perspective. Now, a, a quick side note here, identifying potential successors for you uh, and develop them now, develop them early. Um, you know, we always say to our clients that, that when it comes to implementing an exit strategy, irrespective of what the wider economy is saying, you have to make yourself redundant, particularly in an SME, owner managed entrepreneurial context, kind of remove yourself and, and make space for that person to come through, which will mitigate risk from a, from a trade style perspective, that's for sure. 
Um, scalable businesses with well-developed strategies continue to attract acquisitive interest. Um, and, and my colleague Lake will come to talk about sort of what we're seeing in, in the market from a, from a transactional perspective. So what about valuation? What, what do all these things mean from, from a valuation perspective? Now we've, we've uh, come across a new acronym which has been coined, earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization, it's an EBITDA, so like a standard acronym. EBITDA includes COVID. And this tries to get at the underlying performance of a business having adjusted for the impact of, of COVID-19. Right? And the logic here is that we now need to look at 2019 results from a historic perspective, EBITDA from a current perspective, and forecasts uh, FY21 and beyond um, when, when looking at valuation of a business. Um, historic results from 2019 uh, don't really bear much relevance to, to today. Um, so, so we need to have an emphasis on, on, on forecasts. And that's something that you know, the FD Centre, I'm sure, can help you with if you don't already produce forecasts as an ongoing sort of financial requirement. Yeah, in terms of trends and value drivers, we're seeing, we're seeing all sorts. Um, valuation multiples have, have held in sectors such as software, healthware, tech sectors, and, and that's obvious, right, given, given what we're seeing in the wider economy. Startups will continue to face headwinds and, and more cautious valuations. Um, deal prices are, are holding up, um, uh, where transactions were well advanced in Q1 um, and, and where businesses are strategic to purchases. And the private equity community remains open for business. This is a very different scenario to 2008, in, in my opinion. 2008 was a liquidity issue. Uh, today, we're talking about a healthcare issue. So uh, private equity have got lots of dry power, and lots of capital to deploy. Um, but naturally, and obviously, they're cautious. And so valuations for them have dipped sort of 20 to 30% in the short term. Um, this is backed up by a recent survey of M&A advisors which carried out by data providers market to market. Uh, we found that most SME advisors anticipated a circa 25% reduction in valuation in the second half of, of this year. And, and so in terms of value drivers, so things that will uh, push up your value, um, buyers remain focused on, on, on cash generation, on intellectual property, um, on, on defensibility of your business, and, and strength from the management team, which goes back to that whole succession point in terms of finding the strategic leaders in your business and develop them now. So, so an obvious question to ask is whether now is, is a good time to grow via acquisition. And I think the short, the short answer is, is yes. Um, according to research carried out by the Boston Consulting Group, um, weak economy deals yield on average a 9% higher um, return, uh, total shareholder return than, than strong economy deals when measured over a two year period post, post completion. And as we've seen at PDM Corporate Finance, the technology is in place to, to complete transactions. We've managed to close uh, three deals since March and we have a few more completions before year end and, and, and they will talk about one of our, one of our larger deals completing um, when, when he comes on, on stage as it were. Um, vendors are more receptive to um, increased risk sharing, earn out payment structures, um, and funding their own deals via, via vendor loan notes. So I, I guess the key takeaways here are, you know, number one, uh, be prepared, put in place an ongoing target screening process uh, that, that covers strategic priorities. Uh, number two, be bold, boldly pursue downturn M&A opportunities if they um, if, if they materialize, downturns on average um, uh, deliver good returns. Um, so uh, take advantage of that. Um, and number three, be transformative. Um, transformational deals can be useful to stay ahead of the curve and accelerate out of the recession um, when, when the upturn returns. Um, and, I, and I guess there's, there's a fourth, um, uh, fourth sort of deliverable here, a fourth instruction, stock up on lots of toilet roll. Uh, because as I said at the outset, we, we are day one into new lockdown and I wouldn't want any of you to be caught short. Um, and on that note, I'll, uh, I'll hand back to, to Jeremy. Thank you. 
Um, and I, I'm glad I've seen that one before because I struggle not to laugh when I see that. Thank you, Phil. Um, that was a brilliant presentation. It just reminds me how powerful having a, a finance director, part, part time FD, and then our, our friends from PEM on a transaction, and, and not just for the transaction, but in advance, you know, years in advance, having conversations with you. I love the 10 command, uh, commands as well. Uh, um, so, so we now know the exit strategy, and uh, thanks for, for sharing that with us, uh, Philip. And we've got an idea also of the business valuation. So now the work begins, I think, um, and it's getting the house in order. So I just want to cover with you some of the key steps for getting your house in order. Um, and it starts with, believe it or not, hiring a CFO or FD. Of course it does. If you're a small business, though, you might not have one. So that's why you would um, be looking to hire um, a part time finance director. And the FD will help you in that journey towards your exit. So key aspects, a strong financial performance, as Philip said, and I alluded to earlier in the case study I gave you that strong cash flow and profitability with good financial management, we can achieve that. And, uh, demonstrating a history of two or three years um, of uh, progress and growth in that area will be really attractive to a, a potential buyer. And then the quality of your team. When you talk to investors, they will often tell you about various things um, that they place value on. Um, but the management team is always up there in the top five. And uh, with the right management team, you can achieve anything. Also for consideration for you as well, if you're looking to, uh, to exit a business, then um, it's important. And, and if you're thinking that you might not be part of that business post exit, then it's important that you actually build the management team around you, a team that can demonstrate that they can run the business when you've left the business and, and uh, anybody buying your company will obviously be interested in that. So putting the right systems and processes, the financial controls, gearing the, the business up to look like it's got the infrastructure, it's looking professional. And of course, then the USP or the IP. But it's investors will be looking at a number of things, obviously the management team, as I've discussed, but it could be the product, it could be the opportunity, it could be the market, it could be the customer base, your customer base. And it's important to understand that and then working at how you articulate that. Uh, to potential buyers is where the value comes in and that links to your business plan as well which is looking at the future it's looking at yep historically you've performed here but what's the future what's the growth story and uh, it's important that that growth story and that business plan is a credible plan it's based on realistic robust assumptions that you can articulate and, and, and easily and uh, and potential buyers can buy into and finally, the timing. Um, businesses have different values uh, according to a number of facts around timing. You know, the natural evolution of your business, there will be different values at different times. Do you take another three years to see if you can grow that profit even more and get more cash in the bank so you've got a more, uh, a stronger financially sound business? Or do you take the money now on the grounds that someone else potentially could get the synergies with their business and make more money out of it and, and grow value quicker. And this is where Lake and the corporate finance team at PEM will really be able to help you there and share with you some of the options that you've got about um, exit. And uh, Lake will be talking to us shortly on exit options. But before I, I hand over to Lake, I'd like to just share with you one final uh, case study. And this was a business that we worked with where we were looking at both the operational aspects of the entrepreneur journey, as well as the strategic aspects. So this was a multi-channel retail organization. And um, this business uh, was first set up in 1974 by a husband and wife team. They set the business up in their front room and uh, the business grew and eventually they needed to move out to some dedicated retail premises. And that's, that growth story continued. The business continued to grow and eventually they ran out of space in those premises and needed to move to a much bigger site. The business continued to grow. Nearly 30 years later, this business had grown by then to 20 million turnover. The problem was it wasn't that profitable. 
So it was making less than a million a year in profits and it had cash flow issues. So they reached out to the FD Centre and we took a look under the bonnet of the financials and we identified opportunities to improve the cash flow, the profitability. We implemented new, more sophisticated systems and processes that could deal with this business as it was growing rapidly uh, and scaling. Even employing people with the right skill sets uh, uh, was a challenge. And we helped the business with the strategy to continue this good growth. So it was important. So we were looking at things like the, the, the marketing plan, how we were um, marketing the business. Um, it was, these, these are the, the days when retail, online retail was really growing rapidly and that was a key source of growth for this business. But as well as that, there was geographical uh, expansion as well. And as we worked with the business, it became clear that actually their end in mind, their why was outside the company. They wanted to exit. They'd worked hard and they wanted to realize the value of all that hard work over the years. So we started to put the house in order and start to move on that journey towards the exit. Three years on, this business sold for 70 million pounds, which at the time represented a, a profit multiple of 23 times. And during the three years that we worked with this business, it grew from 20 million to 40 million, uh, doubling turnover effectively. But more importantly, profitability more than trebled to over 3 million and the cash flow issues were resolved. And this is why I joined the FD Centre. Some of the uh, entrepreneur journeys that we've been on, some of the journeys we're on as I'm speaking to you today, they're exciting and rewarding for everyone involved. So if you want to grow your profitability and cash flow and, um, and grow the value of your business, then come and talk to us. We love working with small businesses and we'd be delighted to take a look under the bonnet of your financials and help you improve your financial performance uh, and realize your full potential. And at this point, it's my pleasure to hand you over to Lake, who's gonna to talk to us about exit options. Over to you, Lake. Jeremy, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about realistic exit strategies for right now. Uh, the current m and market, and then how you might go about rebooting uh, your exit strategy. But, but first of all, um, I've noticed that polling seems to be really topical this week. So I'd like to do a poll um, and just ask you all a question, uh, two questions. Firstly, is anyone out there considering exit or succession within the next three years? And then secondly, regardless of time scale, what is you most likely exit route for your business, do you think? So we'll leave the poll up uh, for, a, for a short while. It'd be great if you could all um, let us know what you're thinking. Um, now, something else that's really topical is the use of technology in healthcare. Um, and um, I'm sure many of you um, at some stage in your career will have had a text message from your GP confirming their appointment. And it's really likely that it will have come from a recent client of ours because they have more than 50% market share in this stuff, a business called MJOG. Um, we recently so advised on the sale. Um, and I mention it um, partly because it's topical, uh, but also um, because it's a great example of the things that are driving a quite active m and market at the moment. The first thing is sectors in a good sector, healthcare and software. Secondly, it's strategic intent of buyers. We sold it to a Swedish business called Cree which already had a UK business doing video uh, GP consultations, so great fit for their existing business. Uh, liquidity in the market is driving things. Cree had done a big fundraise, had loads of money to spend on growth. And the last one, slightly less relevant for MJOB, but is tax. A lot of people are looking at exits now, worried about what the Chancellor might do to the capital taxes regime. Not a market driver, but in passing, it's worth mentioning that this business was nicely prepared for sale by an FD Centre style FD who'd been working for them for a couple of years in the run up to our getting involved. The current market, this is data from Mark to Market, which is a fintech business we get transaction data from. Um, you can see clearly the steep fall off in activities. We went into lockdown in April, but then a steady build up since then. And actually, as of September, 
volumes aren't that far off uh, from what we were seeing in 2019. So a reasonably buoyant market, and we're certainly busy doing deals at the moment. So I'm going to talk to you about some uh, practical exit choices. Um, I'm going to look at buyouts, employee deals, private equity and trade sales. I don't have time to go through all the details. So what I'd like to do is give you a flavor of the differences, debunk some myths um, and give you some practical pointers for these COVID times. But maybe now if we just um, have a look at the answers to the poll, just to, so that we can try and reflect that as we go forward. Kira, can we bring up the, the poll answers, please? So that's, there we go, that's interesting. Considering exit or succession within the next three years, um, probably the majority not. Uh, but what I think is more interesting, given where we are at the moment, is that um, a healthy 40% of folks still thinking about it within that time scale. And then which exit route is most uh, likely? Um, <clears throat> trade sale and buyout, fairly neck and neck. Um, that, that makes sense. Uh, small number to private equity, the buyout and trade sale balance reflects our activity usually. What surprises me slightly that nobody out there thinking about an, an employee trust. Um, so that's that's really interesting. So what I'll try and do is just reflect that in the emphasis as I go through uh, the rest of the, uh, the session. So um, management buyouts then. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm talking about succession buyouts here. So where the vendor initiates the sale, sale to sell to his or her team. If you have a stable or profitable business, a good team, then this is a viable option right now. Basic structure is probably familiar to you. 100% of the company is sold to a shelf company for a fair price. You should get capital tax treatment, so 10 or 20% tax. Funded by cash in the company, debt, loan notes issued to the seller, and maybe private equity. Management team, you'll expect to invest some cash to make sure they're committed. Some practical points for uh, COVID days. Um, first thing is to say it's very feasible. There's plenty of cash around. We're doing one of these at the moment where there's been lots of private equity interest and the banks seem happy to go up to two to two and a half times EBITDA for a cash flow loan. And in terms of COVID, the key I think is scenario planning. Uh, we don't want to burden the business and you need to make sure that we build in cash flow flexibility into the deal. And the myth around buyouts is that the trade sale will always pay more. Um, if you're selling and if you're prepared to wait a little bit longer for your cash, you can always pump the price a wee bit. Um, yes, strategic buyers will sometimes have the opportunity to pay a really big price, but it's not always the case. Another way to get your employees involved is to consider an employee ownership deal. John Lewis is very much the poster boy for this kind of thing, although in fact it predates the employee ownership trust legislation by quite a long way. Um, you need to sell more than half the company to the trust. It's very tax efficient for the sellers who pay no tax at all. And the aim is very much about long-term employee ownership. Flip side is it's very unfavorable in terms of tax treatment on a subsequent exit. Funding is broadly similar to a buyout, but private equity is likely to be difficult because there's no easy exit to be had. Employees can enjoy up to 3,600 per annum of tax-free bonus. And qualifying conditions, all the employees must benefit on the same terms and the target needs to be a trading company. I do think you need to think about cultural suitability. You may need a different culture if the business is going to become all employee genuinely. And I also think about motivation. Do employees really feel any different? And perhaps more importantly, will the key managers have enough skin in the game? I think you need to value continued independence because the disincentive to sell from a tax standpoint can act as a, a bit of a poison pill. And the myth around these things is that it's the only way to achieve employee engagement nirvana, which is what you'd get if you listen to the Employee Ownership Association. In fact, you can achieve most of the same things with a properly structured buyout. So just comparing and contrasting these two things, they both address succession and exit through employee participation. Key differences, tax on the way in, the trust is better, on the way out, the buyout is better. Senior team motivation, I think it's better on the buyout because they have more skin in the game. Customization, buyout slightly better. 
culture retention within the business, I think the buyout is actually better because for most OMBs to go to a full employee ownership is a culture shift. And finally, people's motivation across the company, I think it's probably about the same, to be honest. So they're both really good options, uh, but you need a compare and contrast. Private equity. The myth here is that they're all sharks. And, and maybe at the big end, the big ticket stuff, all the financial engineering boys, they are. But actually, there are lots of really good investors who are not just bringing money, but are really able to help the business grow and develop. These guys prefer businesses making a million pounds EBITDA or more with a consistent track record. And they will bring changes in ownership style. And of course, the deal is predicated on a later exit. They'll need management to stay in, or if you're the seller, at least to have a managed exit. Some practical points uh, for COVID times. There's lots of appetite from these guys at the moment to invest. And indeed, some of them have funds where there's a time by when they have to have them invested, COVID or not. So there's, there's plenty of money. Um, I would suggest that you should expect some softening in valuations and certainly some conditionality in deals. We've seen the use of convertibles and earnouts and things like that. But the deal process doesn't seem to have slowed down that much. Um, fingers crossed, I'm due to close the deal tomorrow, uh, sale of an online training business to a private equity house. And uh, that's taken three and a half months from signing heads of terms to um, getting the deal done, which is not bad, actually. And finally, the trade sale. There's two flavours here, either a negotiated sale or an auction. An auction is the marketing the business to get competitive tension between multiple motivated buyers. Negotiated sale, you're dealing with just one buyer, often someone who's approached you. It's obviously harder to get competition in that circumstance, but this is where Jeremy's team's work can really help so that you make a good first impression when the unexpected buyer turns up. The myth around this is that it's really time consuming. Probably an auction takes six to nine months, but if you have got your house in order, you can shorten the preparation phase and you can shorten the diligence phase at the back end. Practical points for now, um, I would say two of them expect consideration to be performance linked, given the uncertainty. And the other one is, if I'm honest, I think it's probably difficult to launch an auction during a full lockdown. So uh, if that's your plan, wait till the 2nd of December, if you believe Boris. So how do you make a coherent strategy uh, from these four choices when things are uncertain? Well, picking up on some of the themes from Jeremy and, and Phil, Get your house in order, build your strategy back up from the ground and be decisive. Think about timing. We like to use a traffic light system when we're helping owners to assess timing. This is a made up example. You can reflect on whether enough of the lights are green or amber for you. Uh, but in this example, it's a good sector. It's a business for the good sector management. And then a couple of green lights that are probably common to all. Sterling's not going up anytime soon. And the kind of tax regime, frankly, is probably as benign as it's going to get. It's a bit of a battlefield out there, isn't it? So I suggest that we take a lead from the armed forces. The battlefield strategy is a series of iterative loops. So get your strategy going, keep testing it and flexing it. If forecasting is difficult, then do multiple scenario planning and reforecast more often. So to summarise, we are busy doing deals, then all four of these exit options remain perfectly feasible. Pulling all the themes from today together, this is a good time to get your house in order, to revisit your strategy from the ground up and to start thinking proactively about growth, acquisition and exit. In short, don't let the current crisis deter you from making plans. And I'm going to hand back to Sean now. Thank you to Phil and Jeremy too um, for those interesting presentations. We now move to the Q&A uh, segment of this webinar. Um, I received a few questions, so I will start with Philip first. Um, the question is, if I start a sale process now, won't the value of my business be uh, depressed due to all the uncertainty? No is the short answer because um, strategic buyers would always be willing to pay a premium for
for the right kind of business, number one. Number two, again, picking up on, on the things that have been discussed today. If, if you've got your house in order, if you've done your right strategic reviews, um, if you've got your information together uh, and you're able to present it in a coherent method, uh, you, can, you can point towards positive historic performance. You can ring fence current performance by way of having an EBIT DAC number earnings before interest, tax depreciation, amortization, and COVID. So you can kind of ring things that. And, and, and if you carry out robust forecasting, um, you know, with, with the caveat that you know, the consideration might be performance linked, you can actually mitigate or, or try to mitigate risk for a buyer to say, look, we're in the right industry with the right opportunities. It's the healthcare issue. This is not uh, fundamentally an issue with my business. We can trade through this. These are the forecasts, and we're willing to have the consideration linked to that. So, if now is not the right time because um, there are a chance of buyers out there, then there's an opportunity to kind of bang down hatches and, and get ready to go when the time is right. Thank you. Um, the next question, um, so the term FD springs out here. So, this is, will be one for Jeremy. Um, how does the part-time FD model work and how long would it take um, for them to kind of implement all this? Okay, <laughs> so um, there's a couple of questions there. So perhaps the first point about how does it work? Um, so uh, typically our, our finance directors will, will work um, with a business and it could be anything between one day a month right up to two days a week or even more depending on what's happening. So for example, if you were going through a, a transaction um, or you perhaps you were going through an acquisition, you were buying a business, then it's likely there'd be more intensity so that time could go up. And the point is we, we flex it around what the business needs are. And we'll start with a, uh, a review of the business. So we'll go in, we'll take a look under the bonnet and we'll identify the things that need addressing and fixing. And we'll sit down with the business owner and we'll say, right, this is, these are all the things that we've seen so far. This is what we think we should be working on. Our view is probably a day a week, and, and that's probably what you need. Um, and as we work through it, other things might come over the horizon and we can have a conversation. But I think it's, it's fair to say it's, it's flexible and it's about working with the owner on a flexible basis. And what the benefit of this is that the owner is getting value for money at the strategic level so uh, the fd is coming in it's it and the fd is concentrating on those strategic aspects and you're getting the, the benefit of all that experience and the, the the fd will build the team around them as well so your finance team they are probably capable and your systems are probably capable of doing a whole lot more but you haven't got the fd steering it so we can go in there and we can effectively get a lot more at your existing uh, team and infrastructure in terms of how long, again, it, it's really dependent on, on, the, um, on the situation. Typically, we look to work with business for the long term. We, we become part of that journey. So the journey I shared with you earlier, you know, we come in, we'll have a look, we'll get the foundation stones in, operational aspects and, and, and the strategic. And that could be a journey to your end in mind, you know, an exit in five, ten years time. And we've got a number of clients who we've been working with for over ten years. Um, but... Um, and we, we do occasionally do interims. We're not really an interim organisation, but we do. A uh, classic place where that might happen is with um, finance directors who, um, that, you know, they're the FD of the business already, um, but they are undergoing some really bu a bit busy period. They might be going through a transaction or a systems implementation, and they've got the team, but they need the support of another FD, someone who's got some experience at that level who they can just hand stuff to and they can hit the, road, the, the, the ground running uh, and can be an asset to them rather than them having to spend time on activities. So, of course, we do do the interim piece uh, as well, but our focus really is on those long-term journeys. And in terms of how long it would take to achieve the things that you've seen here, um, we would expect within the first month that we will identify an opportunity for improvement that will more than pay for our fees. And, and that's where it starts and it continues. And if you look at the case studies that I shared with you today, for example, um, the, the building services company where we turned that business around and, and increased its value by 10 million, 
that was achieved, that part of it was achieved in about 18 months. In terms of the, um, obviously the other, the retail business, uh, we were working with that business just over three years. But I would say it's, it, it's we, you'll receive the benefit um, pretty much within the month that you start working with a, an FD. But the, the, it's all about the strategic stuff and it's the long term growing your business and achieving that end in mind that is the focus. Hopefully that, uh, that covers the, the, the question, Sean. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I guess. Pose a question to Lake, um, the best person for this. Of the four exit options that you discussed, um, which are most certain to be deliverable over the next year or so, um, given what's happening uh, in the economy and uh, with COVID, etc.? Uh, that's a good question, actually, because they're probably not equally easily delivered right now, even though they're all sensible enough options. Um, probably the clear winners would be either one of the employee deals, the Employee Ownership Trust or the buyout, um, especially if uh, you're minded not to raise external finance for them. We, we sometimes see people doing buyout deals. The company has quite a lot of cash on the balance sheet, so that's always available to get cash out up front. Um, in which case, the great attraction of these is that you've got all the parties around the table already. Existing management, new management, and really the only third party then is a tax man. You need to get a tax claims. And right now, I can report those are still going through, although the revenue are um, getting astonishingly slow at the moment. So I would say those would be front runners. And actually, even if you raise external finance, I put them ahead because um, for the right proposition, um, you know, profitable cash generative business with good management, um, both the banks and the PE guys are still really keen uh, to put money out there. Um, trade sale and the, um, the straightforward private equity deal, slightly more complex, I would say. These people would probably scrutinize rather more of what you're doing. Um, and particularly with the trade sale, as Phil said, the way not to get a discount is to find a strategic buyer. Um, that just takes a bit longer to find the perfect match. Um, but if you do, if you come back to my earlier example with, with MJOB, uh, then there, there are some really good deals to be done out there. So I would rank them, uh, when you factor in complexity, I would rank them buyouts first, employee deals, and then I would probably put um, PE in trade sale, uh, Trump and Biden like rather neck and neck. with this question um so how sh how should i go about pitching an offer um if i'm making an acquisition and the target is underperforming uh, due to covid well it, it all goes down to whether or not um you believe in the story um our our, our sort of modus operandi at pdm corporate finances we can, we can kind of drill down into the numbers of course we're all qualified to do that but, but it's all about the, the story, the narrative. Um, what's the rationale for sale? Um, if it's a retirement sale, are the exiting vendors easily replaced in your existing business? Or um, would that require um, some sort of investment? Then it's about the market opportunity. How well positioned is the target business in their existing market? Um, can opportunities be eked out from a growth perspective? Um, I, think, I think we've got an interesting scenario um, in the sort of world of corporates and, and SMEs currently where um, you know, COVID-19 obviously is, is hugely debilitating, but in some scenarios, businesses were always going to struggle. Um, what what COVID-19 has done in, in many scenarios is just accelerated the digital transformation process. So I, think I referenced the, the high street retail world as an example. I think changing societal and behavioural shifts was always going to lead towards an overwhelming um, move in the direction of online um, online sort of purchasing behaviors as opposed to people going into stores and the people who were going into stores 
um, we're looking for an experience rather than just going in, buying a pair of jeans and, and leaving. Well, why would I leave my house? Well, I can't do now because of lockdown, but in, in, in normal times, why would I leave my house and leave the comfort of my home and I can click a button and, and, and purchase jeans? So all of these um, things need to be factored into how you structure an offer. Um, and, and, then, and then it's about payback um, from purely from a, from, a, from a sort of buying perspective. Um, and, and mitigation of risk. Um, and, and it comes down to uh, your, your investment in that business. How quickly will you get your money back? And if you think about a multiple uh, in it being sort of the, the, the number of years it will take to get your money back, um, we see sort of software businesses and, and SaaS uh, businesses going for double digit multiples, even in these sort of post COVID 19 times, because um, typically they're scalable and there's lots of growth. Um, it's all available, and so it will take longer to get your money back. But it's it's it's, it's almost a sure bet uh, rather than um, a, a manufacturing business or, or, or dare I say a, a metal bashing business in these current climates. Um, so all of these factors need to be considered when it comes to structuring. But uh, no, just to finish off, it comes down to the narrative, to the story. Do you believe what the seller is telling you in terms of the growth prospects aside from COVID? Can it trade through? Um, and, and what are the growth opportunities and the strategic plays that you can, that you can make? Can I just add a, a, a little practical point, which is that I, I would be strongly advocating if you're buying a business to think about some conditionality in it. I'm, I'm working on an acquisition at the moment with a, with a media agency, and we've seen it in a few others, where um, we, we're putting in earnouts in the structure, but what we've seen both buying and selling is the earnouts are less predicated on growth now, but just on saying, well, if you get back to your pre-COVID days, that's fine, I'll pay you your pre-COVID price, but I want some insurance as the buyer that I'm not going to end up paying full whack for the business as it looks now. So, um, and, and I think that's working quite nicely because sellers kind of expect it. And therefore we're not seeing price expectations gaps opening up, which is the killer of course, because if you get that, you don't have a deal. So variable pricing is, is the other. Once you've done all the thinking about the story that Phil rightly says has to come first, then the way you do the horse trading is by um, some kind of variability in the deal. Thanks, Lake. Um, this will be the final question. Um, uh, Jeremy, um, you mentioned a couple of case studies uh, and the sectors that uh, those, those businesses are working in. Um, do you just work in those sectors or is there a wider range? Yeah, good question. Um, we we have no, uh, we, we don't concentrate on any single sector we've got. There are, I think it's 233 uh, part-time FDs working across the UK now, and they've worked in all sorts of se uh, sectors. So you can imagine the wealth of knowledge that we've got in all the various sectors. So even if uh, an FD is working with a business in one sector, say it might be manufacturing or retail, um, even if they haven't got that much experience in that particular sector, there's a number of other people that have that can support. So uh, we, we, we're basically uh, across all, all the sectors and um, effectively working with one FD, you get 232 other mines free. Excellent, thank you. Um, now we're nearly at noon, so now's a good time to bring the webinar to a close. Um, thanks for everyone who submitted a question. I hope those speak speakers were useful and helpful with their, in their answers. Um, these are our speakers on screen. If you have anything else that comes to mind, um, please get in touch. I'll circulate these contact details um, in an email after the event, um, including, um, say, uh, some summary slides. Um, so thanks very much for attending today. I know you're all very busy um, uh, day to day running businesses. And thanks for your time. Thanks for attending. And I wish you a good day and goodbye.